taught in the parables of uh, Matthew chapter 13. Uh, Connor and I began last year by the, going through the book of Matthew, and this is all the farther we've gotten to the end of chapter 13. And uh, Lord willing, after the um, Friends and Family Day, we'll pick up with Matthew 14. Probably it won't take another whole year, but, you know, the Beatitudes do take a while uh, to sort through. So uh, uh, it's well worth the time spent. But this morning we want to consider the eight parables of Matthew 13. We're not going to go into detail with all of these because some of them have already been presented, but just as a kind of summary of the kind of wisdom that Jesus taught. The miracles of Jesus proved that he was who he said he was. The parables explain metaphorically about his kingship and about his kingdom. And we do find eight of them in Matthew 13. So let's begin with the first one, the parable of the sower. This has already been discussed, but uh, we want simply to point out that there are different responses to the same seed, which is the word of God. Four different responses to that seed being sown. The various responses are not the fault of God and are not the fault of the seed. The seed is the same. The responses vary, not because of God, but entirely on the basis of the heart of the receptor. All are invited into the kingdom. All are given an invitation to be part of the kingdom. But among those who accept, initially, some will fall away because of persecution or because of the cares and the riches in this world. But the invitation is given to all and encouragement is given to all uh, to remain in the kingdom and to grow and advance. Whether or not we grow as good seed is up to us. This parable teaches that each one of us is personally responsible for how we react to the seed, to the word of God. God doesn't make the decision for us, as Calvinism teaches. Our decision is likewise not determined by our genes, as philosophy might say. We cannot let someone else make up our minds. We must make the decision on our own as to whether or not to follow Jesus and follow God. We are individually responsible. Jesus said, uh, he who rejects me and receives not my word has one that judges him. The same that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. John 12 and verse 48. And so the seed is there, the word is there, the encouragement is there, the offer is there. It is up to each one of us to accept salvation. We choose our own response. God doesn't choose us for it. Society doesn't choose it for us. We are the ones who must make the decision. Then we come next to the parable of the tares which is in Matthew 13, 24 through 30, and explained in verses 36 through 43. This has also been covered, so we won't go back over uh, the basic material, except to say that this is another kingdom parable. It teaches us 
that as long as the world stands, there will be a conflict between good and evil. Only at the end of time will a true separation occur when the tares are gathered and burnt in the fire. The question is, which kingdom are you in? Which kingdom are you associated with? Is it the kingdom of love and light that offers a reward for obedience? Or are you in the kingdom, the one of selfishness and darkness and pain? It is described as there being wailing and gnashing of teeth in the text. The choice should not be a difficult one as to which kingdom you ought to be in. But again, it's your responsibility to choose the right kingdom. The one planned from the foundation of the earth by God. The third parable is that of the mustard seed in Matthew 13 31 and 32. Since these are so, so short, let's go ahead and read these. Matthew 13, 31. Another parable he put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all the seeds, but when it is grown... It is greater than the herbs and becomes a tree so that birds of the air come and nest in its branches. This parable shows that the kingdom began in a small way, but it soon grew to be quite large. Now, the first two parables that we've already briefly mentioned have to do with choices and personal responsibility. This one and the next one have to do with the kingdom and growth. Truly, Jesus and his 12 apostles started off in quite a small way. It was a small beginning for Christianity to have to spread into the entire world, but it did. Let's take a look at uh, Colossians chapter 1 and verse 23. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 23. Now, this was written sometime between 62 to 64, some 30 years after the death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of Christ to heaven. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 23, Paul says, If indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. Now, I don't know any men who could organize that much coverage of the gospel in so short of time, do you? In a period of about three decades, they went from 12 to having preached to the whole world. That's an amazing thing, and that's why we have the parable of the mustard seed predicting in advance what was going to happen after Jesus' death and resurrection. The apostles, of course, took over and began to preach on the day of Pentecost. They remained in Jerusalem for quite a while. And so probably the word spreading only took about 20 years to get into the entire world. An amazing thing. But they were dedicated. They were obedient. They were interested in serving the Lord who died for them and rose again. 
And so there is this prediction and completion of the growth of the kingdom, starting small and becoming large. The next parable is similar in Matthew chapter 13, the next verse, verse 33. In Matthew 13 and verse 33, we read another parable he spoke to them. The kingdom of heaven is like uh, leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal until it was all leavened. This shows how the gospel spread. We know that it did, but this tells us how. By members, well, the apostles initially, but then all of those who were converted by them, taking the gospel and teaching others concerning it. Jesus himself said that his disciples were not of this world. Let's take a look at uh, John 17. John 17, as Jesus is praying on the night of his betrayal, and he's praying on behalf of his disciples, he says in John 17, 14, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Remember, the earlier parable talked about there being this conflict between good and evil until the end of time, till the end of this earth, this age. Verse 15 continues, I did not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am am not of the world. Sanctify them through your truth. Your word is truth. And so there will be a conflict. There cannot help but be because righteousness is going to provoke those who are unrighteous. Not through taunting or anything like that, just simply by the fact of its existence. Many will take offense. Jesus mentioned this conflict earlier. Paul mentions it later. But all who will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. 2 Timothy 3 and verse 12. But even with conflicts, the only way to convert others is with contact. If we were to circle the wagons and form a community set off and apart from the world, how would anyone be converted? Now, it is a risk because we risk being influenced by the world more than we influence the world. That can happen too. But there has to be contact if we are going to bring others to Christ. We might like to feel like we would like to be isolated, but that will not spread the gospel. The more people see true religion, the more they will desire it. And the more they understand it concerning what it really is and how it is actually genuine, the more they will be drawn to it. Well, next, let's go to the next parable, which is Matthew 13 and verse 44. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid, and for, uh, and for joy over it, he goes out and sells all that he has in order to have that uh, treasure. 
This shows the value of the kingdom of God. It is worth everything. In fact, the king is a descendant of the former King David. Let's go back to 2 Samuel chapter uh, 7. 2 Samuel chapter 7. And let's notice verses 12 and 13. When your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you. And who, uh, who will come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Now, to whom is that referring? No, it is not Solomon. Although Solomon did build a house, he built the physical temple. However, the spiritual house, the house that Jesus built, lasts forever as described in Daniel chapter 2 and verse 44. Let's take a quick look at that verse because uh, Daniel is interpreting the dream of King Nebuchadnezzar and that dream involved this kingdom. And the same one that David is not only over physical Israel, but his heir will be over spiritual Israel. And so the promise made to David is relating to the same king and kingdom that is described here in Daniel chapter 2. And in verse 44, as he interprets it, he says, And in the days of these kings, the God of heaven shall set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. It's the same kingdom that David would promise his heir would have. This is the same kingdom. We know they are the same because they are both eternal. They last forever. No kingdom of man lasts forever, but the kingdom of Christ does. And so David lived uh, hmm, a thousand years before Jesus established this kingdom. Daniel lived more than 500 years before the establishment of this kingdom. And yet they both prophesied of the kingdom of Christ over which Jesus now reigns, according to Acts chapter 2. Let's Look at Acts chapter 2, beginning with verse 30. Acts chapter 2, because this is where we see the fulfillment that uh, all the kingdom passages, we only looked at a couple, but all of the kingdom passages are fulfilled on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. Let's begin with verse 29. Peter says, men and brethren, let me speak to you freely, of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and uh, buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. If you have a reference Bible, you will see a reference to 2 Samuel 7, 12. The passage we just read a moment ago. This is the fulfillment. Christ is the fulfillment. He foreseeing this spoke concerning the resurrection of Christ. That his soul would not be left in Hades nor his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God has raised up of which we are all witnesses. Therefore being exalted to the right hand of God. And having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, that is, the kingdom, he has poured out uh, the, this which you now 
see and hear that, of course, came from the Holy Spirit. You cannot belong to any civic group, any government program, or any world religion begun by men that can compare to Christ and his kingdom. Not a one of them was foretold a thousand years in advance. Not one of them was foretold 500 years in advance. Only Christ and his kingdom has that kind of notoriety before it came into existence. It is so valuable that you cannot go to heaven without it. You cannot go to heaven without being part of it. Those who obey the gospel are translated into that kingdom. Colossians 1, verses 13 and 14. And by the way, it is that kingdom which Jesus shall someday deliver up to the Father, 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 24. Another parable dealing with the value of this kingdom is found in Matthew chapter 13, verses 44, or rather 45 and 46. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls, who when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. That's how valuable the kingdom is. We should be able to make any sacrifice in order to have it, in order to be in it. He gave all the money he had to obtain that pearl of great price. It is worth that much to be in it and to be with God in eternity. One might need to give up not just money, but a job, if that job is of an unsavory nature, contrary to the uh, spirit and nature of the kingdom. One might need to give up a friendship if one stubbornly refuses to abide by the scriptures. For the same reason, one might have to give up family members. And Jesus talked about that. It might never require that, but we should be willing to pay the price if it does. A Christian cannot settle for anything less. He must stick by and abide by the teachings of the New Testament. He cannot allow somebody to convince him that sprinkling is as good as immersion because baptism is not sprinkling. One must be immersed into Christ. He cannot allow someone to convince him that it's all right to sing religious songs with instrumental music because it's not. We are authorized to sing and that's why that's what we do. In other words, you must pay everything to be able to be in this kingdom. You cannot compromise with anyone or anything that would draw you away in some other direction than that where the scriptures lead. Now, the next parable is one that it basically repeats the thought of the parable of the tares. That's the seventh one. And since it has already been discussed, we'll, we'll pass over that one. In order to get to the eighth and final uh, parable, in chapter 13 and verse 52. Then he said to them, Therefore every scribe instructed concerning the kingdom of heaven is like a householder which brings out of his treasures things new and old. Well, who is this householder? Initially, it may refer, of course, to Jesus and also to the apostles, 
who would explain things that they already knew and also provide new insights that they had not heard that are part of the New Testament. There are things that will be elaborated on from the Old Testament and new teachings from the New Testament. Actually, any truthful, faithful, competent teacher of Christianity could be this householder. But he dispenses the valuables that are in the kingdom, the valuable truths that we find and that it contains. And so we benefit now by studying the teachings of Jesus and the apostles, as well as those preparing us for eternity and the rewards already seen mentioned in these parables. So those are four major things that we learn from these eight parables. We profit now from those who know the scriptures. They are valuable. The kingdom is valuable. It is worth all that anyone has to be part of the kingdom, the body, the church of Christ. It is a church or kingdom that has grown from a small beginning into all the world. But don't stop there because there's still plenty of growth potential. We have not yet reached as, nearly as many people as we can. And so we ought not to feel satisfied or smug about what has been accomplished because there's plenty more to do in order to expand the borders of the kingdom. And then uh, as we started this morning, we learned that the kingdom is a choice. It's a personal choice and each one of us is personally responsible for the decision that we make. Have you made that decision? If you have committed yourself to the kingdom, don't let anything stand in your way. Continue to do what must be done. Continue to learn, study, read, reason, apply the scriptures. And let's continue to think about moving forward with the kingdom, advancing the kingdom. But if you have never made that decision, you're missing everything worthwhile in this life and in the next. Please give careful consideration to the preaching of Peter on the day of Pentecost as he talked about the kingdom. And after he finished doing that, people said, men and brethren, what shall we do? And he told them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Verse 41, and about 3,000 were baptized that same day. Verse 47, and the Lord added daily to the church, the kingdom, those who were being saved. If you have not obeyed the gospel and are not saved, we invite you to come. If you have been, but have been rather lukewarm and not totally dedicated, remember this is the kingdom that it is worth selling everything in order to have and be part of. Can we help you? Let us know while we stand and while we sing.